Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Lee, and thank you, everyone, for having me today. Thank you. So um, it's great to see you. I've been doing a lot of talking about you, so it's yeah. great to actually talk with you, because I'm sort of on a book tour now. But um, uh, well, first off, where are you staying, most critically? <laughs> I am staying in Airbnb in Harlem on, I think it's near 125th Street. It's with uh, these two hosts, um, Matt and Gina. They are um, interior designers, and so it's like, it's a, it's a brownstone, you walk up. And actually, it's really cool because they travel a lot themselves, and they try to pick up something every place they travel, and they bring it back. And so they've got like these saddles from when they went horseback riding. So it's a really cool experience. And of course, my mom's here, my girlfriend's here, so we got to cook food last night in the house. So Great, it's really excellent. Fun, yeah. And sometimes we do these things in hotels, but here we're not in a hotel. Yeah, yeah it's often that you and I have conversations at a banquet room in a hotel. It's kind of <laughs> odd that I usually get uh, interviewed in hotels. Yeah. So it goes. So there's so much I want to talk to you yeah, about. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, but before we do that, I think a lot of people in the room, I certainly am very yeah. familiar with your story, but I think a lot of people may not be familiar with um, just your, your, the story of your origin. So I just want to briefly touch on um, how you came up with this idea right. and just sort of the origin story. Can you just share that with us a little bit? Yeah, probably, uh, let's see, it probably begins with my mom, I guess. I guess all origin <laughs> stories start with your mom. So, um, um, you know, growing up, I grew up in Albany, New York, so I actually think of myself more as a New Yorker. I was for 18, 19 years, and um, my parents are both social workers growing up, and, um, you know, my mom, I remember <clears throat> my mom giving me advice when I grew up. She said, um, you know, Brian, we, your father and I, we chose a job because we love it, but we didn't really get paid a lot, so you should choose a job for the money. And so, like, it was very obvious. And so, like, we we're looking at, like, what jobs pay a lot of money. And so, one day I told my mom, like, you know, I think I'm going, I'm going to go to the Rhode Island School of Design. I'm going to become an artist. At which point she said, you somehow managed to pick the only job in the world that pays less than a social worker. You'll get paid nothing. And I said, I'll, I'll make an income. I'll get a job. I promise. And she said, well, I do want you to promise me that if you get a job, that that job has health insurance one day. And so this was the kind of beginning of my endeavor. I went to RISD, and it was totally different because at RISD, everyone was making stuff. They were like, they, they embraced entrepreneurship. And um, I graduate RISD. I get this job at health insurance. I'm living in LA. But one of my best friends at RISD was this guy that, um, named Joe Gebbia. And Joe Gebbia and I were like these kind of entrepreneurial people on campus. And, like, we both started sports teams at art school. It's the hardest marketing job in the world, get an artist to come to a sports game. And Joe lives in San Francisco at this point. This is like 2007. And he's trying to get me to come to San Francisco. He's like, Brian, come to San Francisco. We're going to start a company together. We're going to start a company together. And I'm like, having this job in LA. And I remember at one point, my life was like, I was in a car, and the road in front of me looked exactly like the road behind me. And that kind of terrified me, and I wanted to take a detour. So I have this moment, I'm sure all of us have these moments in our life where we make a change and everything changes after that. I quit my job and I, I uh, put every, I have an old Honda Civic. I put everything I own in the back seat in the trunk of old Honda Civic, including a rolled up foam mattress. I have a thousand dollars in the bank and I call up Joe and I said, I'm coming to San Francisco. And you know, it turns out that Joe said, well, the rent is $1,150. So I actually can't pay rent. It turns out that weekend, this international design conference is coming to San Francisco. All the hotel, we go to the hotel, we go to the conference website. All of the hotels and the conference website are sold out. And so we had this idea. We said, well, what if we just turned our house into a bed and breakfast for a design conference? Unfortunately, I didn't have any beds, but Joe had three air beds. We pulled the air beds out of the closet. We inflated the three air beds. We called it the air bed and breakfast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that noise. Um, and yeah, so that's how I started, airbedandbreakfast.com. So I guess the answer is no, when I started airbedandbreakfast.com, I didn't think I'd be at the uh, New York Stock Exchange. Um, and um, we ended up hosting three people, a 35-year-old from Boston, a 30-year-old from India, a 45-year-old father of five from Utah. But what ended up happening was we ended up becoming friends, and we made enough money to pay our rent. At this point, we say, you know, we're ordinary guys. I bet you there's a lot of other ordinary people like us that want to make some extra money, meet cool people. I asked Joe, I said, well, who's the best engineer you know? Joe said, well, my old roommate Nate is. And so the three of us got together, and we had a simple idea. What if you can book someone's home the way you could book a hotel anywhere in the world? And that's how it started. 
and cut to today, uh, where you have, as Terry said, I think it's more than 160 million guest arrivals, yeah. as you call it. Yeah. Two million people stayed in Airbnb on New Year's Eve alone that night, yeah. and, uh, and you're worth $30 billion, or maybe it's 31 as of last week, I read. So I, just, I should have done this before, but does everyone know what Airbnb is? Please raise your hand if you know what Airbnb is, because you still have, sometimes have to ask. Okay. Anyone ever stayed in Who's Airbnb? Who's used it? <laughs> Anyone's kids stay in Airbnb? I usually get more hands. Um, before we get on to other stuff, just one thing that really surprised me out of this whole story that you don't often hear about is how hard it was for you guys, once you decided to, this was going to be your idea, to get it off the ground. Right. People fled and ran away from this idea. People thought this was crazy. We were trying to, um, in summer of 2008, um, I, have a fr I, I meet a, a guy named Michael Seibel, and Michael Seibel says, there are these people called angels, and they'll give you money. And the first thing I thought is, I can't believe this guy believes in angels. So that's how naive I was. And he introduced us to about 20 angel investors and a couple of venture capitalists. At that point, we were trying to raise $150,000 um, at a $1.5 million valuation. So we would have tried to- million with an M. Yeah, so 10% of the company. <laughs> and uh, 20, probably got 20 introductions. About 10 to 12 or 13 probably didn't meet us. We probably met a half dozen people. People mostly ran away from the, well, everyone ran away from the idea. No one funded us. Uh, I guess three, uh, three reasons, or two reasons. The first reason was Joe and I were designers, and as far as they were concerned, designers didn't start companies. Like, we didn't look like a tech founder, which I think is ridiculous, because I don't think you should ever hire someone because they look like something else. Like, you want a new thing, well, maybe they'll look different. But everyone was looking for either the Zuckerberg model, the, like, a Harvard coder. If you didn't drop out of Harvard, or, or you didn't drop out of a PhD program at Stanford, well, you weren't going to be the next Google or Facebook. And the point was, well, like, the previous tech company uh, founders didn't drop out of Stanford. So it was a little absurd. But the bigger issue was people asked, well, first of all, how many airbeds are there in the world? In fact, when we were trying to do our first investor deck, we had to create a total adjustable market. And so the first thing we thought is, well, how many airbed sales are there? And this is before we actually realized, like, because one day somebody said, like, I want to rent my whole, I want to rent my bedroom. And I said, well, all you have to do is get a mattress, inflate it, and put it on your mattress. And I thought at some point we should open the model up. Very narrow. But, <laughs> but the bigger problem was a simple idea. People did not think strangers would stay with other strangers. They thought it was crazy. In fact, I remember, I, if you think you've written about this, but a, one person told me, he said, Brian, I said, yes. I said, he said, I hope that's not the only idea you're working on. And at some point in late 2008, one of the investors told us, because the financial crisis hits, and he goes, listen, the financial crisis is, is hit, the stock market's cratering, I can't even invest in good companies. Are you going to invest in airbeds? <laughs> And so that kind of hit home. So we ended up not raising money, and we ended up providing how, like, we, 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 we say we did the visa round, this is the joke Joe says, which is basically we got, you know those binders we put baseball cards in? We just put credit cards in them. So we probably, each of us, rack, like, I think I racked up, like, $25,000 of credit card debt. So we just, you know, until they stopped giving us credit cards. And then um, late 2008, we provide housing for the Democratic National Convention in Denver. And then we didn't make a lot of money with airbeds, so we thought, well, if we can't sell money with airbeds, we're airbed and breakfast. Let's go into the breakfast business. So we took a weird detour, and we ended up making collectible breakfast cereal, um, Barack Obama-themed breakfast cereal for the Democratic National Convention. We took Cheerios. We called it Obama-O's, the breakfast of change. And we had a John McCain-themed cereal, Captain McCain's, a maverick in every bite. And we basically handmade, like, cereal box in our living room in 2008, made $30,000 selling collectible breakfast cereal, and this is actually how we funded the company. At late 2008, my mom asked, are you a cereal company now? And the and problem- you didn't know how to answer her. Well, no, because technically we were, actually. That's where we made most of our revenue, and so at some point I'm like, well, cereal seems like a good business for now, but I don't want to have a cereal company. And so, you know, that was, those were kind of the dark times. So what's the lesson in there for um, other entrepreneurs? I mean, well, I think there's two things. I mean, first of all, I, um, you know, I, a lot of entrepreneurs meet me and they say, <clears throat> I, I need to have investors, I need to raise capital. And I think, like, we, the first round we raised was $20,000. 
of capital. Like that was the first round we eventually raised. I think that startups today are overcapitalized. I mean, easy for me to say now, but like things get expensive with scale. But you don't need millions of dollars to start an idea. And actually, we almost have a rule that you sh unless you have fixed costs, like you're in the hardware, you have fixed costs, ideally you don't need any capital to create a prototype. Ideally, your co-founders, all with sweat equity, can create the product themselves. But there's this bigger lesson there, which is this. I think we just didn't quit. And I think a lot of people who try to do what we did or try to do other things, they quit, they stopped short. And a lot of people ask, well, why didn't you quit? And the reason we didn't quit is if you start a company, very simply, you have to know something no one else knows about your business. Otherwise, why are you doing it? And why doesn't it already exist? So the big question is, what do you know that no one else knows about your business? You need to have a unique insight. And we had a very simple, unique insight. And it was totally by happenstance. In other words, we randomly rented our home one weekend. And so our unique insight was, it's actually not weird for strangers to stay with other strangers. And you can make a bunch of money, and the people who travel there can save money, have an amazing experience. If people could just experience what we experienced that one weekend, this would be an idea that would spread around the world. And again, maybe thousands of people one day would use Airbnb. And that was our unique insight. And so that was kind of our North Star. And so we just kept thinking to that first week, and that's why we kept going. So you spread very fast, uh, very far and wide, but that's sort of when, uh, the, you know, it hasn't been easy, because no. as soon as you started to get a, to a sizable uh, size, you know, all the opposition started to come out. Then we became work. disruptors. Then you became disruptors, but you have- Which I was growing up, and that wasn't a good thing. I was always in the principal's office. Yeah, you don't like that word, but it is, uh, you are sort of exhibit A of disruption that we so. can talk about a little later. But, um, you know, your, your end user likes you, that's very clear, but many other stakeholders have not. And, uh, and that's because it vi the core business of renting out a home for short term violates local laws in many markets. And you've worked to turn those over in many, many places, but there are some markets that just won't budge, and New York is one of them. This has been a big source of opposition yes. for you. So talk about that a little bit. Why has there been so much pushback, and uh, what's the end game? Yeah, so uh, maybe to back up for a second, when I went to RISD and we designed products, before I got to RISD, good design was if somebody who used the product liked it. And when I got to RISD, suddenly there was this thing called green design, sustainability. And the idea was, it can't just be your product, people like your product, it has to be good for the world. And so we call these externalities. So it's I'm not just a guest and host. When we started Airbnb, we didn't fathom millions of people doing this. So I did not consider landlords, I didn't consider cities. I, it, I, it, was, it, would have been, it was so bigger than what our idea was. Our idea was just to bring two people together. It grew so fast, and I came from the school thought like Craigslist that the community's an immune system and bad people would get ridden from the site by the review system. And I think a few years in, it became very clear that we had to be much more mindful of how we designed the platform. And we hired some great people. One of the people we hired early on who had a huge influence on me was Blinda Johnson. She's our chief business affairs and legal officer. And she's a lawyer by training. And she told me something very simple. See, growing up, I felt like if people didn't like you, you kind of stay away from them because like, you're going to get in a fight and that's really bad. And she said, if you have to meet with people. You have to meet with cities. And even if they don't like you, if, if they hear your story and you hear their story, you can come to resolution. You have to partner with cities. And so we decided that we would have a principle that we would partner with cities. Now, it didn't go totally smoothly, and I wish it was much easier here in New York City, but we started meeting cities, city by city. Over the period of time, what we've been able to accomplish, I'll say this and I'll get to New York in a second, is we now have agreements with 200 cities in the world. We collect a hotel tax. We have typically regulatory schemes. Those regulatory schemes often involve a registration. Um, and they have some, you know, like, I just came from London. London has their own scheme where if you rent your entire home, it's limited to 90 days, so you don't take housing off the market. You can rent bedrooms. And every city's got a different process. In New York City, I think there were a number of things going on. I think the first thing is that we were slow to be here. Um, I think we didn't get our story out early. So there was a bit of misinformation about who our company was. But I also think there were some substantive problems. There was a phenomenon that occurred where landlords decided you can make a lot of money by taking units off the market and just renting them on a short-term basis. And though I think the scope of it was overstated in our platform, this was a real problem. And people were doing this. And I would consider this to be a very bad negative externality. So we were a little behind in this, and we've had to play catch up. And so in New York City, we've done a number of things. 
we've made clear we want to pay collect and remit hotel tax like we do in San Francisco and Chicago and all these cities around the world. We want to limit host to one home, um, so just the home you rent. And I think the basic premise we want is if a city is in a housing constraint, San Francisco is in a housing constraint, New York City is in a housing constraint, we want people to rent the homes they live in, not take off units off the market. And so right now, we've um, San Francisco instituted a cap. They figured after X number of days, you probably don't live there. And so we work with those caps. And this is how we've decided to use it. The last thing is landlords. I know there's some major landlords in this room. And I know not all of them love to have this activity in their building. And so we've instit we're instituting, in the process of instituting, a like, friendly a landlord program where landlords can sign up and we can <clears throat> allow them to get information about who's in their building using it. They can, get, they can even get a revenue share of the income. And, it, and it, they get the peace of mind knowing like, the rent check's probably going to come. And we're trying to get much more tight around people understanding the rules and regulations of their city and their buildings, and to get, I think get a bit more hands-on. And so you have to do these like kind of counterintuitive things. And this is what Jeff Bezos did. This is what Steve Jobs did. This is what Walt Disney did. I mean, Walt Disney bet the entire company on Disneyland. It seems obvious today. And he took the very best animators, and the studio was really angry. So one of the things that's interesting to me about this move for you is that your first product, the, the, the way that Airbnb was created and became viral and became huge, was almost by accident. I mean, yeah, you had this idea, totally didn't think it was going to work, and lo and behold, it was transformative. Yeah. And so now you have kind of the opposite of that, where you spent the past few years sort of developing this product in, in the Airbnb lab right. and now released it onto the marketplace. Right. This is what we made for you. So how is that better or, or, or worse or just different? I'd say different, unclear if it's better or worse. I think there was an element of luck involved with the founding of the company. I mean, I'm, we're lucky that we chose homes first and not, like if we chose chips or experiences first, it wouldn't have worked because you need demand and people aren't searching for experiences, they're searching for places to stay. So it was better as an add-on to start. Um, the major thing is that you launch, you get a lot of user feedback. So I don't think it, I, I think both are fine like Amazon, Apple, they all were very intentional about their second or third, fourth products. Everyone's first product was totally by accident for the most part. Um, so that's, I don't find that being a defining factor. I think the key is, do you put the best people on it or really talented people? Does the CEO spend more of their energy on the new stuff, not the mature stuff, which I think is important? And are you constantly testing? And the other thing is, a lot of, oh, one of the reasons companies fail is a great story of why did like California Adventure not succeed in Disney, for Disney. So Disneyland, next to Disneyland is this thing called California Adventure. It's actually now doing pretty well, but initially it was a huge failure. And the reason it was a huge failure was there was like 50 executives who went to an offsite and they were basically trying to figure out what a new park should look like. They basically violated most laws of how to build a great product. They realized, well, Actually, we make a lot more money on food and beverage than rides, so we're going to have way more restaurants. We're going to serve alcohol so parents can drink. We're going to do a California theme park in California, even though most people visit from California. So it was basically created in a business plan. It was actually an amazing business plan. The only problem is people don't want it. And so then they had to basically redo the park with a multi-billion dollar renovation. A lot of products fail because they start as business plans. And the problem is, the only thing that really matters is that people want it. And your customers do not care that you're successful. In fact, sometimes they do not want you to be too successful because they want to know that they got the value. And so I think the key thing is, are you making something that people want? And if you're starting it because it's a good revenue generator, like, well, your customer doesn't care about that. And so it might be a great business, but not if no one uses it. Well, we're almost out of time. I just have one more question. Um, I talk about your future and um, in, in the book and say that your 10-year goal is to be the first online travel company to reach $100 billion in market value. Is that right or not? No, I mean, I... I, I, I think a market cap goal is not a great goal. I think, I think a different goal would be this. Um, you know, we've completely changed, or we've given, we've created a whole new category of how to stay. And so now we've had 160 million people from every country in the world, but North Korea, Iran, Syria, Cuba, and uh, Syria, South Sudan, and Crimea. So 191 countries are now living together and it's two million people over New Year's, and pretty soon that will be every night. So that's what we've already done. I want to, in the next 10 years, get to this place where we can sell end-to-end -end trips, that we can have hundreds of millions of people every year booking end-to-end -end experiences where the home might be a minority of what we're doing. 
we've completely changed what to do. 10 years from now, if, you're, if it's Friday night, Saturday night, you're like, what's fun to do around here? Whether it's a city you live in or a city you're traveling, you'd look to Airbnb. We've created tens of millions of entrepreneurs that are creating experiences, a whole new part of the economy, which is experience-based economy. And then we've also gone to aviation and started to redefine how we fly. Because what if flying was the best part of travel, not the worst part of travel? So we call all this like magical trips, basically trips that are just amazing, memorable, end-to-end -end experiences. And this is what we want to be doing over the next 10 years. All right, well, it sounds like we're going to be booking our flights uh, on Airbnb or something like that. We'll wait to see. But Brian, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Lee. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.